this again is my talk, uh, weaponized XSS, moving beyond alert one. So, as uh, they mentioned, I'm Ray Doyle. Um, you can find me on Twitter at DoylerSec or my blog, um, www.doyler.net. I work at, I'm a staff adversarial engineer at Avalara. They're a tax company, so tax compliance, sales tax, things like that. Um, basically, the team lead of a, a newly forming pen test and red team. I'm um, competed in a ton of CTFs and ran a bunch. Been on two DEF CON Black Edge teams and one DerbyCon. Um, if you want to get into CTFs, please feel free to reach out to me on Discord or Twitter. I'd love to talk to you about them. Uh, I also collect certs. I've got a ton of them. And I'm just trying to get into mobile gaming and content creation since quarantine has us all inside more than we'd like. So a few cav caveats before I begin. I'm definitely no expert in cross-state scripting or JavaScript in general. Uh, I'm a pen tester and a red teamer by trade, so I am familiar with it, but there are probably those of you out there who know more than me, um, but I'll do my best to try and teach you what I know and explain why cross-state scripting is scarier than some people may realize. In that same vein, this is gonna be a, a very example heavy presentation. So the slides will be available eventually. If not, ping me on Discord or Twitter or anywhere and I'll get them to you sooner. Um, there will be a lot of code, there'll be videos. I'll get them to you as fast as possible if you want them. I also don't participate in bug bounties, but I do know that some of them will want you to sort of prove the severity to get that higher bounty, get the get your um, finding to count. So some for those of you that do, this should hopefully help with that. Um, and yeah, I'm not really going to cover cross-site scripting that much as a, an introduction or protections. I'll touch on them briefly, but this is mostly, like I said, how to weaponize it, how to go from that alert one pop-up to something that a real attacker might use. So in that vein, before we jump into it, um, respond on Discord, Twitter, raise your hand in your room. Who out there is familiar with cross-site scripting and sort of has seen it, knows what the vulnerability is. So I can't really see from this distance, but hopefully at least a few of you. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with it, hopefully I can give you a few more tricks to use either for your bug bounty huntings or maybe even a real engagement. And for those of you who didn't raise your hand, um, especially for the developers, the defenders, things like that, hopefully I can give you a better idea of why some pen testers or sites may say cross-site scripting is medium or even high severity. So in that same vein, during the talk, if you want a live tweet during it, um, please use the weaponized XSS hashtag. Um, if you want to talk about my COVID mullet, um, if I make a mistake during the talk, or if you just enjoy it, please reach out to me. I love having the interaction. So a brief introduction to cross-state scripting. This is from OWASP directly. I'm not going to read all of it, but at its core, cross-site scripting is injecting JavaScript into an application in an unexpected manner that renders it on the client side. So this will usually almost always be used for client side attacks. So an attacker is targeting a user of your web application. So the most basic example of going beyond alert one, alert two. Now, while this is a tongue in cheek joke, I do want to point out that a lot of our defenses against cross-site scripting do come from sort of the, the deny or the block list format. So I have personally seen cases where I reported to a developer that, you know, my payload was alert one. So they fixed it by blocking alert one. Well, technically they fixed my finding, but since they didn't quite understand the severity of what else I could do, Alert 2 would have still worked, as well as all of these examples, probably. So the first example I want to show, and sort of one that will encompass everything in this talk, is loading external scripts. If, and actually on that quick note, I don't, I'm not really going to cover bypassing filters or things of that nature. Um, all of these examples will assume that you can put whatever you want wherever you're loading this cross-state scripting. Um, WAFs allowed nihilist, things like that are good defenses and layering them is even better. 
Um, I want to just show what you can do in a, a perfect world as an attacker. So in that vein, anywhere you that you can put inline JavaScript, like that second bullet, like alert one, you can almost always load an external script. So in this, it's just loading thriller.net evil.js. As an attacker, if possible, it's usually better to go with an external script. You don't have to worry about weird characters in your URL if it's um, a reflected cross state scripting attack. You don't have to worry about length, things like that. So for all of these examples, they're mostly interchangeable. Um, some of them I will show an inline script, some will be external. But for the most part, try to load an external script if possible. So in that same vein, uh, the, the second example I want to cover is staging your cross-state scripting. So this payload will be great if you find yourself injecting into a existing script tag. So for those of you who don't know, if you're already inside of a script tag, you can't set a source attribute. So you're no longer allowed to load that external JavaScript I mentioned in the last slide. So you have to just sort of build your JavaScript inline. You could run into problems with weird um, characters in the URL, things like that. Alternatively, this is useful for if you find yourself injecting into an HTML event handler, where also you're not going to be allowed to load an external JavaScript, but you can use inline JavaScript. So what this will do is it builds a function C, which calls the function A that's defined in your external payload, and then creates a new script tag inside of the DOM sets the source now to your malicious payload, which in this is just bit.ly example. And then once the new variable you created is ready, it appends it to the document, we'll call your A function, and now your external malicious payload can be executed. So the most basic example of weaponized cross-site scripting, and the one that you'll see the most often is going to be cookie stealing. So if you have a injection payload point and you put something like this, it would add an image tag to the document with a, you know, grab.ping, which does not have to exist on the attacker's site. And it will set the URL parameter of cookie to your current document.cookie. Now what that will do is if a user were to end up on a page that had this payload, their personal cookie would be sent in a GET request to the attacker's server. Now, things like HTTP only will protect against this, things like that. But if there are no defenses in place, the attacker now has your current valid session cookie and can use that to basically hijack your session and log in as you without having to know your username or password. This is going to be sort of the, the easiest way you're going to be able to demonstrate severity or even use it in a, a real attack scenario. I've stolen cookies from users using cross-site scripting and been able to log in as them. Another fairly severe example that is relatively common is using it for full-on HTML injection. So on the right side of the screen, it looks like a standard Drupal login page. Um, and actually, I couldn't get the presenter mode to show up, but there are a lot of references and links to some of these um, pictures and demos I'm going to show. It will be provided with the slides if you want to go and read longer blog posts and things like that. But so back to that, the picture on the right looks like a standard Drupal login page. But it's actually a Drupal post, if you look at the URL, that someone used cross-site scripting to rewrite the entire HTML of the document to look like an access denied login page. So a standard user may see this page, see that they're not authorized, attempt to log in with their username and password, unbeknownst to them, that username and password would be first sent to the attacker controlled server, and then they would be logged into the site that they're expecting. So now the attacker has their username and password, and to the user, it looks like everything was just fine. So the example on the left is what the JavaScript might look like. It would, you can create a new div, you can make it the full size of the screen, and then you can add any HTML to that div and build a new login page. So if you're attacking a bank, um, maybe you, you know, change their login page, grab some credentials, things like that. Alternatively, you could just change the content of the website, 
not necessarily to sort of steal things. And I'll have a few more examples later, but I'm sure you can think of examples where if you were able to change the content of CNN.com and send it to someone else, it could have what, huge effects. So I decided to not go with any live demos because we're already using GoToMeeting. I'm using hotel internet. I don't want to risk the demo god's anger too much. So I do have a few video demos I'll talk over and hopefully they'll give a, a live demo example of these attacks. So the first one I want to cover is phishing using cross-site scripting. So in this example, we have a, a basic page that just returns our search query. We may see it in a lot of applications. So if we type the word test, it says our queries test. So if we attempt to check it for cross-site scripting, if we met our query, query alert one, it pops the alert. And I apologize for this small font, but I can zoom in. This is the script that we want to build is a, an HTML um, block that builds a form with posts that will post to our attacker controlled server with the username and the password. And again, these slides will be available. And at the bottom, it just sets a cookie that will only fire this off once. Then on our attacker controlled server, we take all of the post requests we receive with a username and password and put them inside of a creds.txt and then redirect the user back to the query page. So what that will actually look like is, I apparently need to fit. <laughs> so this, even this demo, uh, I angered the gods. So I actually have to clear that cookie because it'll only fire off once. But in the meantime, basically the idea behind this attack is to show a user a pop-up that looks like their, maybe their session has expired and they need to re-log in. But in actuality, it's just an attacker controlled script that makes it look like it. So a user sees this, an error has occurred, please log in again. Um, they don't know why. They type in their username and password again, um, submit that just to get access back to their application. They don't save their password and they're back to where they were. Their query was test, everything seems fine. But on our attacker controlled server, we see a post to the login.php page. And if we actually take a look at the creds.txt file, we got their username of admin and their password of super secret password 12345. Because to the user, it looked like they just needed to re-log into the application, but it was actually the, in the same vein of injecting malicious HTML into the page using that cross-site scripting vulnerability. So, in that same vein, less useful for an attacker, but more useful for people, um, internet trolls, people who are trying to, you know, activists, things of that nature, you can just deface a page entirely with your, with a cross-site scripting attack. So maybe, you know, I'm sure you've seen pages, you know, this has been owned by uh, the cyber um, crash override. So what you can do in the same vein, you load your, load your external JavaScript and it will change the HTML of the page to your message or whatnot. A very common example of this is the Stallone.js, which has been on a lot of fairly famous websites. Um, I've got the defacement code here. Um, again, you can find it. There'll be links to it in the slides. But what it does is it sets a background image. It adds some text that the page has been hacked, um, adds a little more text, and nothing too major. But basically, it's very clear that some sort of malicious activity has occurred on the website. Well, this has actually occurred. Um, so the first history lesson I want to go over, there's a book called XSS Attacks, Cross-Site Scripting, Exploits, and Defense. So this book has a link on an example on the right side where Maria Sharapova's website had a cross-site scripting vulnerability in which someone loaded that previous Stallone.js file. And it looks like, the page looks like the image in the bottom right. So that's the actual payload on mariasharapova.com. Well, when this book was sold on amazon.com, that same cross-site scripting payload executed. So it's a little harder to see, but that image on the top right is an amazon.com URL 
preview for that book in which that defacement JavaScript payload executed. And if you tried to read the book on Amazon.com, all you would see is you got Stallone. In that same vein, the Web Application Hacker's Handbook also had a cross-site scripting payload demonstrating grabbing session cookies, also fired on Amazon.com. So imagine if instead of Alert1, people wanted to use malicious payloads on purpose, they could have attacked every single user of Amazon looking at these books. So while not directly a cross-site scripting attack, I did want to cover an attack in the same vein that can utilize some cross-site scripting elements. Um, and there's a great presentation on this from Black Hat 12. Um, it's that man in the middle talk with that disgusting title. But at the core of it is it performs a man in the middle attack to inject HTML and JavaScript. So this isn't necessarily always exploiting cross-site scripting attacks, although you could utilize it with that, but it's overwriting pages similar to what it looks like on the right. So in this talk, someone goes to facebook.com, but is displayed a photo of the, the sky with a yes or no button before they can get to the main page. While man in the middle HTML injection isn't necessarily a cross-site scripting issue, a lot of these attacks could be used in that same manner. So I did want to touch on it briefly. Um, and one more slide on that same idea. If using man in the middle attacks or cross-site scripting HTML injection, you are able to inject an image tag and the user is using Internet Explorer, and I don't mean Edge, I mean Internet Explorer itself, if you use the file URI handler, it will send a request to the server, try and grab this file, but Internet Explorer sees this as a UNC path so for those of you who are more familiar with penetration testing and things like that, if the attacker server is listening for this, it can send a response and actually grab the local user's net NTLM hash from their system, track it, and then have access to at least their local system, if not their entire network. Um, it's a, a very scary attack that I covered more in depth in another talk as well as some blog posts, but at the core of it, just by, by injecting HTML or via cross-site scripting or a man in the middle attack, someone could get your username and password for your computer, not just that specific web application. So let's do another demo. This one is actually stealing passwords. So we're not gonna trick a user into typing their username and password. We're actually gonna steal passwords that they already have. So in this example, we have a, a basic login page with my, my beautiful CSS skills. So on this login page, at the very bottom, it's a little harder to see, but there's a text that says your current language is blank. As it turns out, that's so we can change our language. This website supports multiple languages like EN and SP, um, but it looks like it's reflecting this value straight to the page. So if we try alert one as our language, the pop-up occurs and we, we know that this is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Well, we're not too worried about that right now. We'll log into the web application as our admin user. And I will type the password correctly. So we're gonna save our password. It's a, it's a complicated password. We don't wanna worry about remembering it later. So next time we go to our login page, it automatically populates because we saved it in Firefox. Awesome. So what we can do as an attacker, we could build a cross-site scripting payload that will build a second form with a username and a password field, and it will populate those values using the existing username and password field. So since Firefox automatically populated those first two fields for us, as an attacker, we can grab those two, populate our malicious form, and then send it off to our, sorry, it can grab those two values from Firefox, populating those forms, and then send them off in a GET request to our attacker control server. As you see, it grabs, it sets the username equal to get document, got, get element by ID username, the pass to get element ID password, and then creates a new image 
which will just send a GET request to that attacker controlled server. It's an easy way to send that GET request. Um, whether or not the image exists does not matter. So I convert that page, I URL encode that page, that malicious payload to make my life easier. Um, and then if we set the language to that malicious payload, so maybe we send this to an admin user in an email. It looks just fine, but on our attacker controlled server, we actually get a post request, or a get request containing those stored admin and password values. And if we scroll down on the page that they're at, we'll see our newly created body tag, which is technically not valid HTML, but will work in a lot of browsers, that calls that steal creds method for us and sends it off to our attacker. And if we see, we stored those passwords for the admin user for that um, localhost 8123 page. So, and again, I know this is a lot of payloads. I will share these payloads and slides. But hopefully you can use at least one of these in a real life attack or just demonstrating the severity of this vulnerability. So another one that I haven't seen that often personally, um, and I think I've only used in demonstrations, is you can actually build a cross-site scripting key logger. So imagine in that last example, if instead of we, if the admin hadn't saved his credentials, what if we sent him a link to the login page containing a key logger? Then when he typed in his username and his password, it would be sent to our attacker controlled server. So the very top image shows the malicious JavaScript that we would inject. Every time a key is pressed, it grabs the event, it grabs the character code for that key, and it sends a new, creates a new post request, sending that key as a parameter to our attacker control server in keylog.php. In the bottom left screenshot, we see keylog.php, which just, if it receives a post request containing the key parameter, it will add that to a text file. So every time someone hits a key, on a page containing that malicious payload, it will be sent to our attacker. So it's a little harder to see in the bottom right, but if we had a page that had a maybe a message board with a name and a message, um, every time they typed a character, so P-E-N-T-E-S-T, -E -E it would actually end up in that data.txt file on our attacker controlled server. This is going to be the most useful on login pages where you can grab usernames and passwords but it could still be used on, I mean, a myriad of other pages. Imagine a firewall in which you found cross-site scripting. While it'd be better to do a more malicious attack, you can at least find out what settings they're configuring, what IP addresses their internal network devices are using, um, and potentially see flaws, things like that. So it's a, it's a stealthier version of some of the previous attacks, but it still allows you to grab some fairly sensitive information. So in that same vein, if we don't want to grab the keys one by one, it's still possible to grab other sensitive information. So the JavaScript on the left is an example of grabbing all of the HTML of the current page and then sending it off for our attacker controlled server. Whereas the screenshot on the right is handling a post request containing an image. Um, and there's actually a lot of references in the speaker notes part of this slide, but there are existing tools that will convert an HTML page to a web canvas, which you could then send as a ping image. Um, the biggest uses of these payloads are grabbing sensitive information from pages that you necessarily can't see. So imagine a cross-site scripting vulnerability on a banking website. While you may not be able to grab the login information, if you were to send someone one of your payloads or they were to run across one of your stored payloads, you could potentially grab their account balances, their account numbers, um, maybe their address and their name, things like that. Or if you're attacking maybe a router, maybe you can't log into the application, but you can see the administrative console, see what settings they're using, 
what um, services are enabled or disabled, things like that. So this attack you want to use on really anywhere, any application where there may be sensitive information that you want to get, but you are unable or unwilling to sort of directly attack the login page, directly attack cookies, things like that. So another cross-site scripting attack that I, I have used personally and really enjoy is bypassing CSERF protections. So a brief introduction, CSERF is cross-site request forgery. Basically, it's sending a request from site A to site B to do something, even though you necessarily shouldn't be allowed to. The most common example would be if you were logged into amazon.com and there were no CSERF protections, I could send you to a malicious website that in the background would use your authenticated Amazon session to purchase an item and ship it to me. Well, there are plenty of defenses against CSERF that sort of protect against this. There's attributes in the HTML, CSERF tokens, things like that. Well, for most of these, cross-site scripting can actually defeat them. So what you can do is, with your first cross-site scripting, sort of your first stage of your payload, you can send a GET request to that page you want to attack. So in that previous example, the Amazon, you know, click once page, grab the HTML from that page, parse it out, look for your CSERF token parameter, and then store it in a variable. So that now the rest of your payload, you can send that CSERF request, having defeated all of the protections that they built into that application. So this is actually a, a demo, but is based on an attack that I was able to perform during an, engage, an engagement. I found a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability on an unauthenticated page and a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability on an authenticated page that had CSERF protections. So what I was able to do was utilize the free auth reflected cross-site scripting payload to grab the authenticated CSERF token and make a post under the session of the target. So again, we have our very beautiful basic login page. We also have that same search page we've seen before. There's a comment section, so a guest book, things like that, maybe an internet forum that requires authentication. So we're not able to post to it as an unauthenticated attacker. So we log in as our admin user and we can see the comment section. There are no comments at the time, but it just shows your username or your name and your question or your comment in this guest book or this forum. So again, we check our search query page. It reflects tests. So we will check it for cross-site scripting again. We'll use alert one, our standard, you know, basic payload. It does fire off. So the unauthenticated search page is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So if we take a quick look at the comments page, it does require a valid session. It says you must be logged in. So we know that. And then if we scroll down, it actually builds a SHA-256 hash of our session ID with the salt of secret and adds that as a CSERF token to all of the post requests on that comment section. So we would need a valid session. We would need to hash that and we would need, then we would be able to post to that comment section. So even if it was exposed to the internet, we're not gonna be able to make these post requests. As you can see, this is a pretty long um, value. We're not gonna be able to guess it that easily. But as an authenticated user, we can just post test and it works fine. So what we can do is we can utilize that pre-authenticated cross-site scripting vulnerability on the search page to try and grab the CSERF token from the comments section and then use that to post our malicious stored cross-site scripting payload. And then this payload would be uh, executed on all users' browsers instead of just the one we targeted. So this payload reads the body of the document. This is the same code from a previous slide. It 
reads the document, it parses the request type, it looks for the um, element called CSERF token inside of the response, and then it returns that value to use later in the attack. All right, excellent. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so then it will take, it will send this initial request that we built, send it to the target server, and sorry, it sends a get request to the comment section, reads that response, and then forces out that CSERF token. I don't know if I managed to pause. Okay, I did not. Excellent. So again, this just Creates that request that I said, grabs the token. So once it sends that request, reads the body, and grabs that token, it will then build a second request using this token to send to a post request to that comments.php page. Now remember that we are targeting a logged in user. So if we were not authenticated, an attacker would not be able to grab the CSERF token because it would show that he must be authorized to comment message. But since we're targeting the authenticated user, we're able to send the cross-site request as the admin in this case, but any user. Um, so then if we look at the so then we have our, if we use a payload in this case, I believe I copied. Okay, no, I'm just gonna load that external JavaScript file. So this will load an external malicious payload like I showed in that first slide with that exploit. User sees nothing, but if we go back to the comments.php page, there's now a, a stored cross-site scripting attack, um, which is right there. It's from the user CSERF test, um, which we named our, you know, our malicious user in this case. Um, and if we take a look at that CSERF test user, their message was indeed script alert one, but it could have been any of these more malicious payloads um, that I showed earlier. So if we scroll back down on that exploit.js file, if we take a look, it builds a new message where the name is CSERF, token, CSERF test, the comment parameter is script alert one, and the CSERF token is that token that we stole earlier. It then sends this as a post request to the comments.php page, storing our malicious payload. So now we managed to upgrade our moderately severe reflected cross-site scripting payload to a more severe stored cross-site scripting payload, and we bypass CSERF protection in the process. So, Outside of these generic cross-site scripting payloads, the even higher value exploits are going to come from application-specific payloads. So in this example, it's a, a very basic example, but it's the damn vulnerable web app guestbook. So what an attacker could do for this would be to create a new request and post to this guestbook with their cross-site scripting payload. Now, this specific example isn't a huge deal, but think of anything that you can do in a web application. If that web application was vulnerable to cross-site scripting, there's a good chance that an attacker could do those same things. So if EC2 was vulnerable to cross-site scripting, if your Amazon Web Console was vulnerable, an attacker could potentially spin up new EC2 instances for your user. Even if they can't access them, they're costing you hundreds, thousands of dollars. If an attacker finds cross-site scripting in your router, maybe they can use that to change your wireless password or change your administrative login, things like that. So here is a great GitHub repository of a, a few fairly common weaponized cross-site scripting payloads for specific applications. So if you look on the right, um, the most common ones are actually CMS systems, um, WordPress, Drupal, things like that. 
if you are familiar with these applications, you may have seen that they have been vulnerable to cross-site scripting once or twice in the past. If you're not, these are fairly common applications that allow users to more quickly or more easily sort of build their websites out. Well, if you were to find cross-site scripting on, for say, WordPress, you could use that cross-site scripting vulnerability to do things like add a new administrative user, host on behalf of existing users, things like that. So the trusted sec blog goes into a, a longer example of this post. But if you look on the top right, there's a stored, there's a, a post called SSS post with a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability that actually grabs a not string, which is required in WordPress to basically make any of the post requests you might make as a normal user, grabs that sum string and then executes a payload for add user. So it sends a post request to the user's add new page and adds a new malicious call, a new malicious user called sneaky user. So now an attacker can log into your WordPress application, potentially as an admin, and use that to change your settings, make, make posts or whatnot. Additionally, if they are able to use this to become an administrative user of your WordPress application, they could potentially then use that to escalate to a system level console on your server by utilizing something like a PHP web shell, things like that. So what went from a moderate to severe cross-site scripting vulnerability resulted in them having shell access to your server. And the second bullet is just a quick example of how many vulnerabilities WordPress has had. Um, I do like WordPress, people knock it a lot, but there have been plenty of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the past that could have caused plenty of people to lose servers, lose accounts, things like that. Oh, there we go. Yep, okay. So, I don't want to go too in depth, but I did want to touch on a tool, a tool called Beef. So Beef is the, um, now I'm forgetting what the second E stands for, um, but it's the, the browser execution framework. And I, uh, I apologize, I can't see my speaker notes. I don't use it as much as other people, but at its core, EAF allows you to load an external JavaScript file that will turn your target's web browser into basically a full-fledged agent, similar to maybe a Metasploit agent, things like that, you're able to interact with the user browser in a, in a clean, easy UI and grab a ton of stuff. You're able to grab local IP information. You're able to grab browser information, things like that. And remember, all of this is just coming from JavaScript within the user's browser. Obviously, this is going to be fairly heavy network and file size wise, but you're able to get all of this information and then potentially use this user for further attacks. So these has options for port scanning using your hooked browser. Um, the way that works is your target's browser would send a get request to an internal IP and a specific port, and then would check if it timed out or received no response, things like that. It also comes with a ton, I think it's up to almost 600 now, of Metasploit payloads. So if you are able to hook a target running an older or a vulnerable browser, you could actually just use Beef to execute this malicious Metasploit payload within their browser and then get a shell on your user system, which you could then use to attack that user further, pivot into their internal network, things like that. It's a, a huge framework. Um, there have been plenty of talks on it. I provide a ton of resources, but if you are doing a real engagement or specifically attacking users, you may want to look into using Beef. It does make life a whole lot easier. You don't have to send multiple cross-site scripting payloads, things like that. So here's another just quick example of honestly just some of the Beef payloads. So it will do a lot of those examples I showed earlier as far as stealing cookies, um, 
stealing sensitive information, your basic alert pop-ups, phishing, redirection, all of that, um, as well as some other fun stuff. But yeah, it's a it's a huge framework. If you want to actually attack some users, this may be what you want to look into. But remember, all Beef does is writes JavaScript and HTML for you. Anything that Beef can do, you can do with inline cross-site scripting or external JavaScript using any of these previous examples. Oops. So this is an entirely separate topic that I do want to touch on. It's called blind cross-site scripting. What this means at its core is there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in an application, but you personally cannot see the JavaScript execution. So imagine a, a comment or a help support form that you fill out, but the name field is vulnerable to a cross-site scripting vulnerability. When you fill out this form, you may, you put your malicious name, you put your comment section, maybe you upload a file. When you hit the submit button, all you see is, thank you for submitting your feedback. Our customer support representative will get back to you within 24 hours. And that's it. As it turns out on the back end, when the help desk technician goes to view your ticket, a, the cross-site scripting payload actually executes within their browser. Maybe it's a different administrative console. Maybe it was vulnerable and you couldn't see it. Um, but that's sort of an example of just because you can't see the payload execute does not mean that the application is not vulnerable. So the first three links here sort of cover examples as well as a bit more in depth what blind cross-site scripting is. But the bottom two are actually tools you can utilize to find these blind cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So when the user executes your payload, these tools will send back a request to your controlled server saying, you know, your blind cross-site scripting payload for was executed by this user on this date and potentially from this application, things like that. Blind cross-site scripting is great for attacking things that you may not be able to get into. So in addition to, you know, like I said before, attacking the help desk, imagine if you're on some unauthenticated web page or just browsing and a firewall in line at your company was vulnerable to cross-site scripting from the logs. So while you may not be seeing any cross-site scripting, an administrator viewing their firewall logs is now executing your malicious JavaScript payload. You could use that to gain admin access to the firewall, things like that. A lot of times this will be used to either laterally or vertically escalate privileges. Because if you're not able to see this, your payloads, it usually there's usually a reason for that. Either your payloads are ending up at an administrator level, a different user, things like that. Um, it is a, a very in-depth talk. I highly recommend you check out some of these examples, especially as a if you do bug bounty hunting. Um, this is a, a huge attack service that you may be missing if you're not checking for it. So after all of these different payloads and stuff like this, let's take a trip down memory lane and take a look at some real life examples of weaponized cross-site scripting that cause some pretty bad or at least interesting issues. So I can't give a cross-site scripting talk without covering the Sandy worm. So for those of you who are a little older, you may remember a website called MySpace. Um, there's a guy named Tom, he pretended to be your friend. It's a great website. As it turns out, MySpace profiles were vulnerable to a stored cross-site scripting attack. So a, he was fairly young at the time, a young Sammy Kamkar, who is now a InfraSec security researcher, blogger, talker, great guy, I've spoken with him plenty, um, actually found a this cross-site scripting vulnerability on his MySpace profile. And I didn't want to show all of the code because his, his actual payload is very interesting technically and has a lot of bypasses, but it's pretty gross to look at. And what his payload did was actually add to someone's profile the text, but most of all, Sammy is my hero, 
and then added the payload to their profile. So if I visited Sammy's profile, my profile would say Sammy's my hero, and then the payload would be on my page. And then if one of my friends visited my page, Sammy would be their hero, it'd be on their page. And it, it ended up spreading to over a million users on MySpace. It is technically the fastest spreading internet worm. It brought down MySpace, and if I'm not mistaken, some of Fox's servers as well. Um, and there are some more links. It's a really interesting vulnerability that is one of the earliest examples of a cross-site scripting worm. So it was in the same sense of a, a application level or a, a system level worm, it was self-replicating. It spread to every profile for everyone who viewed it, and it was persistent. Um, it's a, a really interesting story, and it's part of the reason he ended up getting uh, arrested the first time. The only time? I'm not sure. So a sort of less severe but very interesting vulnerability was actually in the Uber driver portal. And I want to share this one more so because it's a, a wonderful write-up and shows that just because a cross-site scripting vulnerability doesn't seem severe, doesn't mean that you can't make it more severe. So the top left screenshot demonstrates someone setting up their Uber profile, only they set their home address to be a malicious, in this case, it just alerts the domain, cross-site scripting payload. If you've ever driven for Uber, you know that no one else can see this information. Um, and this was not a blind cross-site scripting. It wasn't that Uber administrators could see this. You are the only one who is ever able to see this address. So it doesn't seem like that big a deal. I can maliciously attack myself. Kind of cool, but not that useful. What someone was actually able to do was they set their personal driver profile to a malicious cross-site scripting payload and then used a full attack chain. So they sent an attack chain an attack chain to their target that logged into the, or well, the target would have already been logged into the Uber application. It created an iframe, still logged into Uber. It logged them out of their driver profile. It logged into this malicious profile since the attacker knew the username and password, it could allow them to log in. And it executed that malicious JavaScript. And if, since it was still on uber.com, it was able to grab the domain and cookie information from the target driver's profile since it was the same site and things like that. Um, it's a great read. It's a, a very in-depth cross-site scripting attack chain that I really can't cover in a minute or two here, but it's a, it's a great example of why just because a cross-site scripting vulnerability doesn't seem that bad, does not mean you should ignore it or not fix it, things like that. Another really fun one was Barack Obama's website was vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Um, and a few security researchers found it, but it was inside of the, basically the volunteer and the mailing list section of the application and the server. So if you take a look, someone is trying to change their email address for Organizing for America, and my.barackobama.com is actually popping an XSS payload window. You can imagine what sort of things you could do with this. If you had HTML injection, you could change Barack Obama's website to be in support of, at the time I want to say it was against Hillary Clinton. So you could have changed four users you're targeting, if it's reflected or everyone if it's stored, his website to appear to be in support of a different candidate or to be in support of maybe values he was against, things like that, or just try and steal and target information of people visiting the website. And as it turns out, I don't have a second screenshot. This payload was actually both re reflected on the email address page, as well as being stored on the back end. So people were receiving emails with this malicious JavaScript or HTML injection. So you could have actually used your payload to send emails containing, you know, modified payloads, things like that, for Barack Obama supporters at the time. A few more real world examples. Um, there are tons of great ones. Uh, highly recommend that second link, the Stack Exchange one. Um, it covers 
ton that I would have loved to go over during this, but I didn't have time. Um, eBay, eBay has been vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. So you could have, you know, attacked other eBay users, made them make bids on your things, um, made them accept offers on their items, things like that. So at its core, cross-site scripting is just interacting with a client browser and potentially a vulnerable application the same way that a user could. So we've got nine minutes left. A uh, few quick acknowledgements. I really want to thank besides SATX, um, letting me present about a topic that I've really enjoyed. Um, and really for working with people, I mean, it's weird having to do a go-to meeting conference. I'm sure everyone is just seeing people, but it's awesome that they got this set up. It's awesome that we all get to at least be together virtually. Uh, I want to thank my company, Avalara. I don't know if you've noticed the theme, but the slides are orange, the shirt is orange, the logo is orange. I didn't pick the color, but it's what we work with. Um, I did want to give a shout out to Eversec. We are both a CTF team and hosts of CTFs. Um, please reach out to me if you enjoy CTFs or if you want to build challenges for us. It's a lot of work and we love procrastinating. Um, I do want to acknowledge my girlfriend. She made sure that I got this talk finished and clean. And I actually managed to finish up some of the slides while she was driving. Um, so I definitely appreciate that. And you guys for being here. Um, if no one came to my presentation, I wouldn't have been able to give it. Um, and again, if you watch this talk live or in the video, feel free to reach out to me at any point on Twitter or the B-Sides Discord about cross-site scripting, CTFs, InfoSec in general. So remember, if you're an attacker, a defender, a builder, or a breaker, we're all in this together. The reason to demonstrate cross-site scripting severity is to ensure that people know why to fix it. Um, obviously, if you're a malicious attacker, that's different, but we're all in this together. We want to get this vulnerability fixed. We want to show why it's a bad vulnerability, things like that. So I've got eight minutes left. I will open up the go-to meeting for questions, um, if that's the easiest. I'm also in Discord if you prefer to ask there, but that is all I have left. So, yeah, if you want to use the go-to meeting or Discord, I've got a few minutes to answer questions. And yeah, um, awesome. Thanks for all the Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, I don't see any questions queued within GoToWebinar, uh, but there is, of course, the, the Track 4 breakout channel and the Track 4 in the Weeds channel. Uh, we're seeing some acknowledgments there. Uh, thank you very much, Ray. That was a great talk. We really appreciate you uh, coming and presenting. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad to present. It was awesome being able to present to you guys. Um, oh, we do have a question here. Uh, what was the most difficult aspect of this? Um, one of the uh, one of the attendees of cross-site scripting or the talk or of cross-site scripting. Okay, yeah. Um, so the most honestly, the the most difficult part of cross-site scripting is one that I really didn't cover and it's going to be bypassing the defenses that you will run into. So um, sometimes applications may be encoding or mangling your inputs. Um, sometimes they may be blocking some specific characters like the less than sign, the greater than sign. Sometimes they may be breaking them up or putting them on different pages. The hardest part is actually getting that alert one pop up sometimes. Once you get that and sort of have figured out what you can do to bypass the application, after that, it's mostly just being able to write the malicious JavaScript and HTML that you want, um, which is actually fairly difficult for me. My JavaScript isn't great. And then being able to execute it. We have an additional question. Uh, I'm asked regularly to speak to the three different types of cross-site scripting for jobs. I know how to abuse them, not as good as you, of course, but I find it difficult to be able to speak to them. Do 
you think it's critical to memorize the different types and provide textbook answers? So, I think it's important to understand the differences at the very least between reflected and stored. Um, and I can cover that answer right now real quick. We've got time. So for those of you who don't know, there are three main types of cross-site scripting. There's reflected cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting, and DOM-based cross-site scripting. Reflected cross-site scripting is a cross-site scripting attacker payload that is reflected in the user's browser. So this is going to be those examples I showed where maybe the search parameter of a website shows the value of what is in the URL bar on the page. So it is, in essence, reflected. These are usually only going to be executed when you send a user a malicious link or they, they click a malicious link, things like that. Um, you can't get them to execute this payload just by visiting any old web page. So these are a little less severe, generally speaking, because they're usually targeted and they don't exist on the server forever. This is contrary to a stored cross-site scripting attack. So this is going to be that example with the in the attack chain I showed, that guestbook page. So in a stored cross-site scripting attack or vulnerability, the malicious payload is stored on the server, and any user that ever visits that page ends up executing that malicious payload. So in a guestbook or a forum, if you make a post with your cross-site scripting payload, every user that ever visits that page will execute that payload. This is going to make it a little more severe because A, you're targeting more users, and B, you don't have to worry about sending malicious targeted emails. You just need people to use their web application as normal. The final one is DOM cross-site scripting. It's a little different because it's injecting JavaScript directly into the document object model. And that, again, is a whole talk or a blog post series. But at its core, it's generally very similar to reflected cross-site scripting, except almost universally, the JavaScript payload ends up after the hash mark in a URL. So if you are familiar with how browsers and web servers and things like that work, anything after that hash mark only ever touches the user's browser. So if you go to google.com hash, this is my super secret password, Google will never see everything after that hash mark. But there is a chance that your browser will do something with the things after that hash mark. So if there was a, a DOM-based JavaScript or a DOM-based cross-site scripting vulnerability, it could use that hash attack, hash mark and everything after it but Google would never see it in their logs, things like that. So it's ostensibly a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability as far as execution and severity, but the results won't be sent off to web application firewalls. They won't be sent to server logs for sort of remediation, things like that. So while it does help to memorize the textbook answers for an interview, the biggest takeaway I can give you is to memorize why stored is worse and how you can attack people with 